Okay, so now that we know something about conservative and non-conservative forces, we can turn our attention to this other type of energy. Uh, so last chapter we talked about um, kinetic energy. This is something different. This is potential energy, and I've got this sort of very technical definition here for you to read. Potential energy, which you've learned about before, is energy associated with the, oh, that's supposed to say configuration. Configuration, that's a G configuration of a system of objects that exert forces on one another. And that's a very technical, jargony definition, but um, maybe if we break it down, we can um, see if we can make sense of it. So let's imagine that I've got the ground here. Here's the ground. And I've got this ball, maybe it's a tennis ball, that's on the ground. And <coughs> if we remember what we learned about potential energy in the past, um, I think we can agree that this object has no potential energy, or we would say that it has no potential energy. And in the past, the way we expressed that was to say that um, it, since it's on the ground, there's no energy stored within it. it. It has no potential to do work since it's on the ground. But uh, what we had said previously is that if I lifted this ball in the air now, so now it's up here in the air, and I'm holding it above the ground, um, it now does have potential energy, and specifically, it has potential energy due to the fact that it's now some distance above the ground, right? It's, it's been lifted some height, and since it was lifted this height, h, it now has a type of potential energy due to gravity, and we call this gravitational potential energy. Oh, by the way, uh, potential energy, you're going to see me abbreviate it two ways. Sometimes I'll just refer to it as PE, and other times I'll use the more technical abbreviation, which is U. So U is used to abbreviate potential energy. So this is gravitational potential energy, and <clears throat> you can see that there's energy stored within it. it. It isn't moving, but it has the potential to move. If I, if I let go of it now, it will go downward, and um, therefore it has the potential to do work. Um, if, if, if there were some ant on the ground here, right, in this ball, the, this ant on the ground would be very threatened by that ball, right? If the ball were to land on the ant, it would do work on the ant, and so the, the ant would be threatened by all of this devastating potential energy stored up in the ball here. Now, if I drop the ball and now it lands, we'll pretend the ant wasn't there so the ant does not get hurt, um, but the ball lands on the ground, and when it lands on the ground, it deforms. So maybe I'll exaggerate it here, but this here's the ball deformed on the ground, right? It hits the ground and it squishes together. Um, maybe if you've seen some high-speed camera work, maybe you've seen a deformed tennis ball. Um, but we, at this point, it, it's on the ground, so it doesn't have any more gravitational potential energy, but it does have another type of potential energy, right? This thing is going to spring back, right? And it's going to bounce back up in the air. So there is another type of potential energy, which is elastic potential energy that is stored up. And so these are two different types of potential energy that we're going to discuss, and both of them do, ha or do relate to the configuration of a system of objects that exert forces on one another. In the case of gravitation, gravitational potential energy, the objects are the ball and the earth, right? You've got the ball and the earth, and it's due to this configuration between the ball and the earth um, that we say the ball has gravitational potential energy, right? It didn't here because it was on the ground, but now the configuration has changed and it's gained potential energy. In the case of the elastic potential energy, the configuration is a little bit different. Now we're talking about the configuration of the molecules that make up the ball itself. By compressing the ball, you've changed the relationship to the, those rubber molecules with respect to each other, and they're now exerting forces on each other. But in both cases, we have here um, potential energy. Now, why do we spend time talking about conservative forces? Well, one of the reasons I wanted to introduce conservative forces is that when you're dealing with a conservative force and, and gravity and uh, the spring force are both conservative forces, there's a very helpful and interesting relationship, and that is this. So, for conservative forces. It turns out that the change in the potential energy, so what I'm going to call delta U, the change in kinetic energy, is equal to the negative of the work done by that conservative force. And we'll investigate this in some detail. Um, 
So this is a very useful relationship that we're going to use to investigate uh, potential energy. But I just want to remember this caveat. This is only for conservative forces. Okay, if, when friction does work, that work is not being stored up in any meaningful way, right? If, um, if I uh, slide a, a, a book across the floor, friction is doing work on that book, and that work is not being stored up. That, there's no potential energy as a result of the frictional force there. But if I lift the object, right, as I lift the object, gravity is doing negative work as the, as the book goes up, right? Or in, in the case of the ball, maybe we should revisit the ball here, right? When I lifted this ball up, as the ball was going up, gravity was doing negative work. So negative work done by gravity here, right? And gravity is doing negative work, and the ball is gaining positive potential energy. Um, by the way, it might be worth noting that um, to remember the work energy theorem, if the ball's at rest on the ground and I pick it up and it's at rest again, so I'm, I'm just holding it here, it's at rest. Work energy theorem says the total work done is zero. Initial velocity was zero, final velocity is zero, change in kinetic energy is zero, total work done is zero. How is that possible? Well, keep in mind that if gravity did a certain amount of negative work when I lifted this up, I did an equal amount of positive work, right? So uh, as I'm lifting the object, I'm pushing up on the object and the object's going up, I'm doing positive work, but gravity's doing negative work. Okay, well, let's investigate our two conservative forces, gravity and um, the elastic force. And we'll, we'll take a look at these two types of potential energy. So let's start with, by talking about gravitational potential energy. Um, so this is start off with gravitational potential energy here. So um, let's remember the equation for work. Work is defined as the integral of f dot dx. And since um, we mentioned that the change in kinetic energy is equal to the negative of the negative of the work done, we can say that the change in kinetic energy delta u is going to be negative of the integral of f dot dx. And let's think about this in terms of the force of gravity. Well, if, if, I, want to, if I want to develop this equation here for gravity, I'm going to say delta u equals the negative of, um, well, what's the force? The force of gravity is negative mg. This is the force of gravity, right? Uh, the force of gravity is negative mg, um, mg being the, the force on some mass m. Uh, and if provided that we're not lifting this thing very high, like we're not lifting it you know, thousands of kilometers in the air, we can say that this value here is going to be constant. And so what we can say is negative mg is the force. dx, we're going to call that dy, because it's only the y direction that's relevant. And so what do I get here? Well, if if mg is constant, um, then I can write it this way. I can say that the change in potential energy for gravity is going to be equal to the negatives cancel, mg times y. Okay. Now, one thing I should probably notice here, or note here, it's going to be mgy, but evaluated from y initial to y final. And that's sort of an interesting idea, right? If I, if I lift the ball in the air, so here's the ball, and I lift it up here, if this is y initial and this is y final, then I'm going to have to evaluate this between y initial and y final. But usually, we're going to call this position, this y initial position, this reference point, you would probably initially choose to call this y equals 0, in which case then you can just say that the potential energy at this point is just mg times h, where h is the height that the ball was lifted. And so uh, frequently, this equation is going to reduce to the potential energy um, due to gravity is going to be mgh. We use this equation quite a bit. And the next few weeks. Um, so let's talk about uh, elastic potential energy. This is gravitational potential energy. So this is gravitational potential energy. 
remember, let's go ahead and talk about elastic potential energy. It's going to be a very similar exercise. The only difference is that uh, when we're dealing with elastic potential energy, the force is not going to be constant. So I'm going to say the same thing. The work is the integral of f dot dx. But if we're talking about the work done by an elastic force, that looks like this, right? Work equals the integral of negative kx dx, which reduces to 1 half kx squared. So now the potential energy, change in potential energy when we're talking about an elastic force is therefore going to be the negative of this, so negative of negative kx dx. So this is going to be 1 half kx final squared minus 1 half k x initial squared. And again, it's your choice what your, what, what your reference point is going to be. What you're going to call x equals 0 is your choice. So in many cases, this is going to reduce to u equals 1 half k x squared, provided that we call x initial 0. So here's another equation that we're going to use quite a bit. And this is elastic potential energy. Okay, so that's a quick introduction to potential energy. Um, some sort of technical stuff in there, but um, as we use it, hopefully it'll make more sense to you.